relationship tools. Uh, so I'll give you an example of a fight on a on a movie. So so the husband comes in from the house, comes in from work, and he goes, "Oh man, where's the food? Didn't you make anything to eat?" And the wife's like, "Well, I didn't know you were going to be home." And then he's like, "Didn't it occur to you that there's more than one person in the house that you need to cook for?" And then the wife's like, "Look, I do a lot around here." And he's like, "You do a lot. I do a lot." And he starts talking about all the things that he does, and she starts talking about all the things that she does, which seemed like a lot more than him. And then he starts talking about how, and she mentions that he's self-centered, and then he says, "Well, I'm a firefighter. How could I be self-centered when I'm going and I'm saving people?" And then he's getting really aggressive, and she's getting really defensive, and then they are going back and forth like this, and it gets really heated. And then all of a sudden, they're talking about divorce. So we started at dinner. And we ended at a divorce. All right. So, so how does that happen exactly? Uh, well, there's a formula for for a fight, right? Just like if you're going to start a fire, you need wood, you need uh, that, something as kindling for the fire, and then all of a sudden, and then you're going to need oxygen, and then something to combust, right? And you need these certain elements to create uh, your fire. And likewise, to create an argument, certain elements have to exist. And one of the things that has to exist is uh, someone has to be defensive uh, or to be defending themselves. Someone has to be offensive or uh, to say something that's going to offend the other. Um, now, sometimes the thing that's said that's offensive was not on purpose. So then when the person starts becoming defensive, the other person doesn't realize why they're being defensive because they didn't know that they said something that was offensive in the first place. And sometimes the person that says something offensive did it totally on purpose. They knew what they were doing and they wanted to hurt the other person. And that's why they said something that was offensive. So regardless of why someone said something that's offensive to you, there are ways that you can evade an argument. There are ways that you can get out of having an argument with someone. Uh, furthermore, confrontation is not a bad thing. Confrontation is the way in which we get problems solved. It's uh, two people coming together to discuss things when they have two different viewpoints. A confrontation is not a bad thing. The confrontation is the is the method to which we uh, solve incongruencies in a relationship so that we know whether or not we need to move on without the person or we're able to work things out with the person. Okay, so confrontation is not a bad thing. You should not uh, fear confrontation. Uh, many trauma survivors fear confrontation uh, because confrontation wasn't good for them in the home growing up. Uh, they didn't have a voice. They didn't develop their skills of assertiveness. And as a result, uh, they don't have the skills now that they need to be able to walk into what would be a potential confrontation and to be able to feel comfortable, confident, like they're going to be able to hold their own uh, and not either snap and fly off the handle or uh, say something they regret or um, know how to express themselves, how to assert themselves. So what are the methods we can use so that we can not fear confrontation, but we can actually go into confrontations being skilled? Because if you have the skills, like the skills of assertiveness, for instance, or the skills of evading an argument, then you don't have to be afraid of confrontation. Again, you don't have to fear confrontation when you have the skills. So how would you rate your skills right now if you had to rate them on a scale of like one to 10? Would you, how, how skilled would you say you are at confronting people or facing a confrontation that uh, someone else is bringing to you? So many of us are like, mm, not too good. Some of us are feeling, uh, I see some ones, I see some fives, I see some eights, some sevens. So after today, we're hoping that's, that skill level number is going to go up, right? Uh, and uh, we're going to run some drills. So I'll allow you to uh, test me out on these skills, and then I'm going to test you out on these skills and that way we'll get to see how we can actually put this into action, how we can actually make this work for us uh, in real life. So we're going to learn real life skills of how to evade an argument, how to keep an argument from happening in the first place, and skills as to how to assert ourselves. 
Um, so the technique that we're discussing is for your notes, E-A-R, the ear technique. E-A-R, it stands for evade, assert, repeat. Evade, assert, repeat. So we'll want to have this uh, method memorized. And this method is described in this book here that's available on Amazon. It has this very handsome man on the cover. And it's written by Roman Zanoni. It's called Mind. Okay. So if you don't have the book already, you go on Amazon, you pick it up. If you have the book, you can join me as I go through this. And what we're looking at is the chapter 20. Chapter 20. Relationship Tools. And we're under the subheading on page 181, uh, the ear technique. Again, ear stands for evade, assert, repeat. So the first thing we need to know is how to evade. It says this, most people's instinct when they are attacked or accused of something is to defend themselves. So when you are accused or you are attacked, do you defend yourself? Be honest. Many trauma survivors actually start defending themselves and explaining themselves and justifying themselves, even when they aren't really being attacked. So even when, you know, you're just uh, running late for something and you go, oh, hey, hey, I'm so sorry I'm late. Uh, it was because blah, 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 and such and such, and so and so's happened. And then there was a thing, it was a car accident and the such and such, right? So they over explain themselves. And they weren't even, nobody even asked. They are certainly not under any attack, but they felt the need to go in all of that, right? That, that is what we want to avoid. So one of the biggest keys to evading an argument, in fact, the biggest key by far, is to never defend yourself. Never defend. And while you're at it, stop explaining that will keep us from over-explaining. Stop justifying. So when we don't explain, when we don't justify and we don't defend, what happens? Well, you're really hard to fight with. It's really hard to get a good, healthy fight going, a good argument with you because you don't ever explain yourself. You don't justify yourself. You don't defend yourself. And when that happens, it really makes it difficult for me as the would-be attacker to maneuver you into a, an argument. And I'll explain really how that works. But keep in mind that no defense equals no argument. So how do we do this? So if someone comes up to us and they, they start a confrontation, they make an assertion about us, they say, hey, you you haven't been helping things out. Maybe they give a criticism. Maybe they show some contempt. Maybe there's a personal attack. Um, maybe they make an, a statement about us, an absolute statement. You never, you always, right? Those trigger us, right? And all of a sudden we start wanting to defend ourselves. So uh, evade technique number one, it says point out what is true about their assertion. When you are accused of something rather than trying to invalidate their accusation, Purposely try to validate it. You do this by finding some part of what they're saying that is true. So here's an example of that. They say, you never help with the dishes. And you say, that's true. I don't help enough. So what you did there, you found something you could say that agreed. You found a way that you could validate their assertion. And, and, what, and what happens? What happens when you validate them? Well, that takes the steam out of the argument. They say, you don't care about me. And you say, you're right. I haven't been showing you as much attention as you deserve. And then they go, uh, oh, well, I thought we were going to have a fight, but I guess not. Technique number two of evading an argument, find something you can agree with or take responsibility for. So instead of voicing your disagreement, you're going to find something that they're saying that you can agree with and then voice it. They say, 
you're selfish and you say, well, clearly I'm doing something wrong to make you feel that way. Or they say, you're sleeping with other men. And you say, obviously, I'm not making you feel secure in this relationship. You're finding something you can agree with or take responsibility for. They say, I have to do everything for the kids. You don't do anything. And you say, I'm definitely not the father I want to be yet. I have a lot to work on. Hmm. Technique number three for evading an argument, share vulnerable feelings. So instead of defaulting to anger, expose the vulnerable human emotion that's beneath the anger. You'll always find beneath the anger, there's something vulnerable, like a hurt, a pain, um, an embarrassment, um, a feeling sad or rejected or invalidated or something. There's something uh, like a confusion or an embarrassment. There's, there's something vulnerable under the, the anger. So when we expose the vulnerable emotion, it helps to evade or diffuse the potential of an argument. For instance, they say, I know you stole my chocolates. And you say, I feel so embarrassed to have made someone I care about feel this way. It's a vulnerable emotion, embarrassed. They say, you're ugly. And you say, wow, that hurt. I've always felt insecure about my looks. Technique number four for evading an argument. Discuss only their points. Uh, whoever starts the discussion uh, has the floor. So if if you come and you, dis you start the discussion, you have a bone to pick with me, then what we're going to do is we're going to discuss only your point until your point is totally satisfied. And then we'll move on to my points. If I start the discussion, then what we're going to do is to just discuss only my point until my point is totally satisfied. And then we'll move on to your other points. And that's how you keep them from shifting. You ever talk to someone who's a shifter? So you say one thing like, hey, I need, I need help uh, with the garage. And they go, but you never helped me with my car. And you're like, I do help you with your car. Next thing you know, you're talking about the car, but you want to talk about the garage. How do we get out of the car? Because you you allowed them to shift the, the subject, right? So, so don't show up to the discussion without your pen and paper. Okay, and you write right at the top of the page, the theme of the discussion. So if you're coming to the discussion and you want to talk about garage, you write garage right at the top of the page, nice and big, and you underline it before you start with anything else. If they come to you and say, I need to discuss with you, you say, one second, you grab your pen and your paper, and then you write down what it is they have come to talk to you about. They say, I'm having a problem with you watching too much television, right? Right at the top of the page, watching too much television. That way we stay on the subject until the subject is completely satisfied. This is, again, how we evade the argument. So we discuss only their point. Technique number five for evading an argument. Repeat their point back. In your own words, if they've initiated the conversation, only their point is what we're discussing right now. So you're going to repeat the point back to show that you understand. So what I'm hearing you say is, am I correct in understanding that? So what I'm hearing you say is, I need to spend more time with the children. Is that right? Am I correct in understanding that speaking to other men makes me a prostitute? When you repeat their point back, then that allows them to validate, yeah, that's what I was trying to say, or to say, no, that's not what I'm trying to say, and then they can go back and try to reassert what it is they're trying to say. We keep going until we're both on the same page. So I think you're saying this. Is this correct? No, that's not what I'm saying. Is that, da, 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 da. okay, I think, I think you're trying to say this. Is that correct? No, is, you keep going until you got it, until they say, yes, yeah, you got it. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, good. Number six, we're going to show radical empathy. We're going to be genuine and speak from the heart. That's difficult to do when you don't like what it is they're saying, but it's possible. So they come to you and they complain about this or that, and you think in your mind, boy, they are dead wrong. But you show radical empathy anyway. And you say something like, it really took bravery for you to express this to me. Thank you. 
or you must have felt abandoned by my actions, or I can see that you feel hurt, or I can tell that this is upsetting to you, or this seems important to you, to which they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, good. Evading argument technique number seven, find something to apologize for. So we're actually going to look for what we can apologize for in the conversation. So we're going to make it a point to apologize whenever possible. I can see why you felt hurt. I'm really sorry. I feel so embarrassed I made you feel that way. I'm so sorry. Does that diminish us as people or diminish our point or our experience or what we have to say? No. When do we get to talk about what we have to say? Well, whatever's at the top of the page is what we're talking about now. So once that's finished, then we can talk about what we have to say. If we're the one who started the confrontation, then we're here to talk about what we have to say. But when they come back at us with this, that, or another, we cycle back into evading the argument, and then we go back to asserting ourselves. So we say, that seems very important to you. I'm sorry to know that there's something that I've done that's hurt you. I'm going to write down what you're talking about so that we can discuss it later. And now, for now, though, we need to finish talking about what I've brought up. And now we've evaded, and we're back to asserting ourselves, which is what's at the top of the page. And then we go back into our point. So when you put it all together, you practice your skills by combining a few or many of those evasive techniques in your response. Obviously, you don't have to use them all, have them all memorized, but you want to practice them so that they start becoming more natural. Uh, so if your coworker accuses you of stealing or your child lies directly to your face uh, or your spouse says that you don't pay enough attention to them or your spouse accuses you of being mad at them or your parents say that you're pregnant and you're not, we're going to learn to evade the argument. Now, if someone is an abuser, uh, you need to disengage from them altogether. And that's what we talked about last week. How do we how do we recognize abuse? And we need to disengage from abusers. So this is this is not to help you in a relationship with a narcissist or someone who's verbally abusing you. This is how we handle a healthy relationship or relationships at work, school, and in business, things like that. So the next thing is assertion. You have evade, assert, repeat, E-A-R. The A is to assert yourself. What does it mean to assert yourself? To be assertive means to tell the truth. To be assertive means to tell the truth. No more lying. No people pleasing. Don't make up a bunch of excuses and reasons and justify and explain and, and make try to make people feel better. No, no, no. We need to tell the truth. When we tell the truth, when we assert ourselves and we tell the truth, that is a skill. That is a life skill to learn to just tell people what it really is. You got to tell people what it really is. Assert. Do you like my stuffing? No. Oh, my God. And then when everyone gets over the shock of you simply telling the truth, everything in the universe shifts. People respect you. People believe you. They trust you. They don't want to step on you. They don't want to cross you. They talk to you carefully. We need to have the ability to tell the truth. Instead of just you stay in the relationship, you don't even like the guy. You're just in the relationship. Why don't you leave the relationship? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to hurt his feelings. Tell the truth. Your job is not his feelings. Your job is your feelings. That's your job. His job is his feelings. So you need to prioritize your job. And tell the truth. Billy? I don't think I should stay in this relationship anymore because I don't have those feelings for you. I don't like you like that. That's the truth. We need to tell the truth. Will Warren hurt his feelings? 
Yes. Have you ever heard the phrase, the truth hurts? It does hurt. I've had people tell me the truth and it hurt. I hated it. <laughs> but I love them. I love the fact that they didn't make me live a lie. That they didn't keep me in, in, in a false sense of reality where I thought I understood how to not be annoying to them, where I thought I understood who I was supposed to be. And instead, they told me the truth. They let me see what reality was. I would rather someone give me a cold, hard reality than to keep me in uh, the bliss of idiocy so that I'm making a fool of myself. And I know you feel the same way. I know you do. I know if I ask you, you want me to tell you the truth? Or would you like me to just gloss over the truth here and, and, and gaslight you. No one has ever said to me, oh, I would rather just be gaslit. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I don't want reality. We prefer reality, even though we know it might hurt. So guess what? Other people do too. This is very important. We got to get out of the childhood. I can't tell people the truth. I can't. We have to get out of that. Other people prefer real. If they don't prefer real, guess what? They're toxic. Those are the people to get away from. That's your red flag. They don't prefer real, run away. Moms, dads, aunts, uncles, they don't want the real. They, oh, we, we act like everything's good. We're, we're going to act like Uncle Bill's not a pedophile. They don't prefer the real. Get away from those people. Let's work with the people who want to live in reality, okay? Uncle Bill is a pedophile, so so let's just acknowledge that and then not invite him when the, there's going to be kids around. It's pretty simple. When we're just real, things start making more sense. We don't have to compromise ourselves trying to uphold the gaslight and act like everything's fine. Oh, I love family dinners. You hate your family. Don't Don't act. Don't be fake. We're going to be real. Now, does this mean we don't care about people's feelings? Of course not. That's why I'm doing this entire thing to give you the skills of assertiveness. The whole thing about having the skills of assertiveness means that you know how to be assertive and give the truth in a way that mitigates the pain that you're going to heap upon someone by telling them the, the truth. That's what the skills of assertiveness is all about. When you're not skilled in assertiveness, then you just say things too bluntly and it hurts. I would prefer that. I would prefer you walk around being too blunt than too people-pleasing. I would prefer you walk around being too blunt instead of too people-pleasing. So start from the place of bluntness and then learn the skills of being assertive. So here they come. Number one. Skill number one of being assertive. No name-calling or violence. There's no need to call someone a name in an effort to, to tell them the truth. That is abuse. The tongue is extremely powerful. Don't abuse your power. When you name call, when you call someone a name, that's violence against them. Don't do that. Number two, state only the facts. State only the facts. To be assertive is to state a fact. Say, I feel uncomfortable. That's a fact. Saying, you did that on purpose. Eh, eh, not a fact. You don't know the other person's intentions or thoughts. Stop it. Stop. You did that on purpose. You don't, how, do, how would you know? You don't know. State only what you know. What you know definitely to be true. You know your feelings. You know your intentions. You don't know the other person's intentions. So state only facts. Don't exaggerate. Using words like always, never. Those are extreme words. Saying, I don't want to. That's a fact. That's abuse. That's a fact. I'm hungry. That's a fact. As opposed to, I always have to. Are you never... That's not stating facts. That's just emotionalisms. Okay, so differentiate. No, no extreme statements. We just stay cold hard right on the facts. 
Number three, use your voice. The number three tool to assertiveness is to use your voice. I want you to view your voice like a superpower, and it is. The fact that we can transmit ideas to other human beings is a fantastic design. It's unmatched in the, in the animal kingdom. There's no other animals that are walking around having philosophical discussions like this. We're on another level. OK, so you can use your vocal cords to complex to convey complex ideas, but you don't even need them to be complex to use your voice. I want you to practice using your voice by just grunting when when you have a problem. OK, so somebody somebody's offending you. They're doing something. You don't know what to say, how to address it. I want you just to just grunt just go Argh! like that. Ah, hmm. You ever, you ever do that? Mm. You hear somebody insult someone at the dinner table, you just go, hmm, just like that. Mm. Mm. When you don't know what to say, just practice using the voice. Just practice using the voice. It's, it's, it's to be good at setting your boundaries. It's, it's about using the voice. Even if you're not articulate yet, even if you don't have all the vocabulary there yet, I prefer ah 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 ah. That is setting boundaries. That is that you're already starting the boundaries just by just by getting the vocal cords moving. Okay, so give them all the grunts. Mmm. Ah. Ooh. Give them all that. <laughs> the vowel sounds right. And and that will help you if you feel like hey I don't have the words I don't know what to say I don't know how to set the boundary. I, Okay, start there, okay? Your voice is your power. Utilize it. Number four, build your vocabulary. In the meantime, don't just leave it like that. If you don't have a good vocabulary right now, you can fix it. It doesn't have to stay that way. So you can build your vocabulary up. How do you build your vocabulary up? Every single time you hear me use a big word, Look it up uh, on your phone or on the computer. Every time you're reading a book and you hear a word you don't know, you look it up. And you, and you immediately start re you start putting it into action in your life. When you're reading books and you read a word you don't know, look it up. Don't just read words and not know what they say or hear, or hear smart people on TV talking or on the internet talking and they say something you don't know and don't just leave it there. Do you think that's what I'm doing? You think when I hear a word I don't know, I just go, oh, I don't know that word. Oh, big words. No, I look it up. Oh, well, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. So I look it up. Like, how long does it take to look a word up? How long does it take to look up a word? Nowadays, seconds. You literally just talk to your phone. You're like, Siri, give me the definition of this word. That's all. That's all you have to do. We live in the future. We couldn't do that when we were kids, right? You had to go find a dictionary. And they weren't easy to find, right? <laughs> you had to be at a library or in your house somewhere. And there's a huge book, right? Remember the dictionary? And you had to open that thing up and go down. Sometimes they have like the tabs with all the letters. It used to be hard to find information. Right now, we're walking around like gods. You can just know, gain knowledge and information like that. So use it. Use it. Build your vocabulary. And as soon as you learn a new word, just start putting it into action. And your friends will make fun of you like, oh, big words. But this is because they don't know what it means. Don't worry about that. Surpass them. Just go ahead. Just talk, 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 talk. Use these words. Once you use it three times, you got it. It becomes a part of your vocabulary. And now you're going to be walking around like, oh, you don't know what that means. Oh, my God. <laughs> it helps. We got the emotional color wheel on the website mindfree.org, free PDF. You download the emotional color wheel. It's got all these emotions on it. It helps you in your skills of assertiveness to be able to say, uh, I'm feeling perplexed. Oh, you're using different words. I, I'm feeling a state of contempt, right? I feel culpable. You're, you're finding different emotions, ways to express your emotions. So build your vocabulary. It helps you to be uh, more assertive uh, because when you have uh, vocabulary, you have a choice of words. It's a lot easier if I have to tell someone the truth um, that they're that they're eating a lot, right? Rather than just saying, you're greedy. 
right? Because I don't have vocabulary. It's more skilled if I can tap into my vocabulary and say, oh, you know, it seems it seems that at you know, from other people's perceptions, you're having more than your fair share. Now, of course, I don't want to assume this is just perception. Now, when I put it softer like that, they can it's easier for them to take. That's skills of assertiveness. Number five. Skill of assertiveness. Use the rule of seven seconds. The rule of seven seconds dictates that you will wait five to seven seconds before responding to anything ever. This is a life skill. Don't just immediately respond. We have to stop feeling like we need to respond in rhythm with what people are talking about. We feel like we have to respond in rhythm. Hey, where you been? Oh, I've been out at the such and such. They said this. No, we say that. They say this. Now we say that. They ask the question. Now we go and we got to we gotta respond with, our, with an answer to the question immediately within one to two seconds. Who made that up? No. You take your time. They ask you a question. Let the awkward pause commence. And you just sit there like this. And they're going to be sitting there like this. Why are we not talking? What is happening? Did he hear my question? What's going on? And then you're thinking five to seven seconds, you're allowing the time to pass. And what's going to happen when you do that? A lot of good things happen during your five to seven seconds. What happens during your five to seven seconds of pausing before you speak, before you answer a question? Well, for one, your chemicals are re-regulating. So you're getting the dissipation of the adrenaline, the cortisol in your system. That stuff will make you say some crazy stuff, right? The first thing that's going to come out of my my mouth, right? My husband says, uh, some some will look like I'm gaining weight. I'm going to say, look like your head gaining weight. It, the first thing that comes to my mind is going to be the harshest thing. When I wait five to seven seconds... All of a sudden, some of these tools come back. I go, oh, evade the argument. Okay, yeah, I can respond with vulnerable emotions on that. And say, oh, wow, that was that that remark hurt me. I've always felt self-conscious about my weight. Whoa, that's more powerful, isn't it? Because a husband who gets hit with, he has a fat head, goes, oh, man, what's wrong with you? Oh, oh. He has to defend himself. But a husband who gets hit with, oh, my wife's feelings are hurt now because I was insensitive, feels a little different. He's more likely to get to the apology, which is where he needs to be in the first place. And so we help him to get there, how? By using these skills of assertiveness and evading the argument. We can't use these skills if we don't stop to think. So the reason why you're like, I learned this stuff, Roman, it's been great, but I just can't do it. You can do it, but but you got to use the part of you that can do it, which is the cerebral cortex. Take seven seconds for that old baby to fire up. It's a dinosaur. But the animal brain, that thing is like this. So if you're responding in the animal brain, then if you're responding in the animal brain, then what? Your responses are going to be automatic. Number six, always remain calm. When it comes time for you to express yourself, you should always do so calmly. Rarely raise your voice unless there's a life-threatening emergency or you're celebrating something. This will require you to wait in the same room with people before speaking rather than yelling across the house. So we're going to wait till we're in the same room so we can tell them, hey, look, um, this and that, such and such, so-and-so, rather than doing the no, it's in the da 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 Right. As soon as you're doing that, where you're already yelling from room to room, you've already got voices, voices raised. As soon as the voices are already raised, then it's already difficult to, to, to engage in a calm manner, right? So practice bringing down, bringing down, bringing down the volume so that we can engage with people in a calm manner. Uh, and I'm sorry, before I was interrupted on the rule of seven seconds, uh, we want to make sure we, we, when we pause for seven seconds, that pause, that drop shifts the power dynamic. So when you pause for seven seconds, the other person who was questioning you or putting the pressure on you now starts to feel the pressure shift back to them. And they start questioning in their mind, what did I just say? 
what was the thing that I just told that person? What was the thing that I just said? And as we shift that power dynamic and we put that pressure back on them, sometimes they start apologizing before we even have to speak, before our seven seconds is up. If the person tries to pressure you to start speaking before the seven seconds is up, you can just put the finger up like this. And you can tell them I'm thinking. Okay. So let's put these skills into action. Let's put these skills into action. So we're going to evade, assert, repeat. Due to time, I can't finish going through the, the other techniques of, uh, of um, assertion. Uh, but you can learn about them by, by looking in the book, by getting this book right here. That's the book that, that we're reading from, Mind Technique. So let me give you guys some quick examples and we'll open up for the group discussion. So if someone comes at you with criticism and they say, um, you always, you always talk too much. So how do we use the ear technique in a situation like that? Well, since they came to us, then it's not so much that we have something to assert. So we're going to evade the argument on this. So they might respond with a, oh, I'm sorry to hear uh, that I've been speaking too much from your perception. Probably I am a little bit talkative at times. If they, if we go to someone with something that we want to talk about, perhaps we need more help around the house and we get hit with defensiveness. Uh, so we say, hey, you know, I've been kind of taking up the majority of the housework and I need you to kind of step in. And they say, it's not my fault that I'm not doing housework around here. You're the one who's such and such, so and so and such and such. Now they hit us with defensiveness. Now what do we do? Well, we need to evade the argument and get back to reasserting our point. And then we're going to repeat if they want to continue to be defensive. So it'll look like this. Well, it's not my fault that I'm, I'm doing the such and such and the so-and-so. Uh, it's really your fault. And you say, it sounds like what you have to say is something that you feel passionately about. And no doubt it's something that's very important. What I can do is I can write that down so that we can discuss that after we're finished talking about the thing that I came to talk to you about. So what I came to talk to you about is that I need more help around the house. So I appreciate everything you're doing, but I, but I need more help around the house. Now the ball's back in their court. If they continue to be defensive, then we can try to recycle back. We repeat. We go back into evade. Okay, I appreciate your, your perspective on that. I'm sorry for anything I've done that's bothered you. Uh, however, what we're talking about right now, and you go back to asserting, you use your voice, you tell the truth, and, and you use the techniques that you need to use in order to get your point across. What I need help with is, is getting the dishes done and such and such and so-and-so, okay? If you're dealing with someone and... Um, they start hitting you with the generalizations that you never understand and uh, everything else. They try to take you off of your point. You have to remember to stick to your point. And so you evade, you evade what they're going through right there with all of this. You say, clearly, I failed in something to make you feel that way. Uh, however, and then you circle back to your point, which is on the top of your page. However, and then you go back to, what I'm, what I need from you is such and such, so and so. I'd be happy to talk to you more about these other things at another time. Ultimately, what should we do if they show an inability to uh, capitulate and have a, a decent, organized conversation with you? What do we do if they show a, a, an inability to capitulate and have a decent conversation? Well, we close the conversation, and we might try again at another time but there's a possibility that, that that person is, the relationship is insalvageable because once you cannot have a discussion about problems and you can't have a confrontation with the person that's productive, then 
there's nothing that can be done for that relationship. 